Welcome back everyone to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday I make these videos to give you an all-inclusive recap of all the biggest Starship development updates and space news from the past week. Today I have lots of grounds to cover once again from the aforementioned Starship program, SpaceX's successful Nilesat launch, NASA shared some updates regarding the Artemis II Orion capsule, the ill-fated Falcon 9 1069 appears to have been brought back to life, the James Webb Space Telescope suffers from some damage, and much, much more. Let's go! Beginning as usual with Starship news, Ship 24 was removed from suborbital pad A last week and it was rolled back to the launch site after its first round of testing. An eagle-eyed Redditor caught this clip of the ship with a big dent being completely pressed out during its first pressurization test as well. Yes, I remember back in the early days, a few of us were a bit worried about how flimsy the steel vehicles can look, but once those dents get pressed out, all of that perception quickly falls away. Anyway, back to the present day, Ship 24 arrived at the high bay and over the next few days SpaceX will begin installing its Vacuum Raptor 2 engines and its three sea level Raptors as well. Hopefully a static fire will soon follow, it has been far too long since we last got to see a Starship roar. Speaking of the Raptor 2s, SpaceX are still pumping these engines out at the production plant. Ezekiel Overstreet caught this video of a Raptor 2 static fire on the vertical test stand. And in fact, let's quickly talk about Booster 7's engines. In last Monday's show, I discussed how SpaceX were moving forward with the installation of Booster 7's 33 Raptor engines, and wow, Elon Musk shared this photo on Saturday with all 33 of them already in place. Even for SpaceX, that's a pretty fast installation speed. Each of these engines will produce 230 metric tons of thrust at launch, which will be about 7,600 tons of total thrust, which is insane. For reference, the Saturn V, the current record holder for the most powerful rocket ever brought to operation, outputted a mere 3,400 tons of thrust. It's going to be mind-blowing seeing Starship Super Heavy take off for the first time. Starship Gazer caught this photograph of the new E-Dome test tank heading towards the launch complex. This tank sports the new lower profile dome design that we've seen floating around the production site. Naturally, SpaceX will want to validate this design with a test tank rather than just jump straight to building an entire Starship with it. Hopefully, this tank sails through its test campaign without issue. Should anything go wrong, or right, I guess, I'll be sure to cover it in a future video. Make sure you've hit subscribe down below so that you never miss your Monday Space News Rundown. And hey, I gotta shamelessly ask that if you are enjoying today's video, then do leave a like down below as well. It really helps support the channel and I always very much appreciate it. Now, an agonizing one hour after I finished editing my Space News video last week, Elon Musk shared some new Starship images with us on Twitter. If only he'd shared them like two hours earlier. Oh well, I guess I can talk about them today instead. The video he showed us was unfortunately a victim of Twitter compression. I've tried upscaling the pictures as best I can in Photoshop. This shot here shows the design concept for the Starbase factory building, which is currently being constructed at Boca Chica. When it's done, it'll replace the tents that SpaceX are currently using, and while I do have a bit of a soft spot for the tents, this building looks like a very welcome upgrade. We also got a picture of the future Starbase facility in Cape Canaveral. Luckily, I have a slightly better remedy for the terrible Twitter image quality. Sushi Fox Studios created an animation based on the image. And I'll just use this for the B-roll. <laughs> Interestingly, this facility only sports the one narrow old school style high bay, not the new mega bay design that's being used at Boca Chica. This facility is already being built as well. The building in the foreground here is already well into construction, and we expect that this building will be used for the storage and maintenance of Falcon 9 rockets. Kyle Montgomery caught some great shots of this building's construction earlier this year. The final noteworthy piece in Elon's post was this SpaceX animation of how the Starships will deploy the Starlink V2 satellites. Ship 24 will be the first Starship to feature this deployment mechanism, which consists of a narrow door and an unstacking mechanism that's not too dissimilar to an industrial pallet stacker. Whether or not this will be how SpaceX launch their satellites long term, or if they'll shift towards a more conventional style of deployment, remains to be seen. 
But then again, nothing about Starship is really all that conventional, is it? <laughs> now, SpaceX had a successful Falcon 9 launch on Wednesday. The rocket took to the skies from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, carrying the Nilesat 301 satellite on board. This is an Egyptian satellite operated by Nilesat, and it carries transponders for TV broadcasting and the provision of internet services. Weighing in at about 4 metric tons, the satellite is currently en route to its final location in geostationary orbit, where it'll expand Nilesat's African coverage. Eventually, it'll replace Nilesat 201, which is expected to run out of fuel by the year 2028. The Falcon 9 itself made a successful landing on the drone chip just read the instructions, though rather than using its engines to propulsively land, this time SpaceX decided to simply teleport it to the deck. Ready? Boom. <laughs> I joke, of course. The live stream clearly just froze during the landing itself. Or did it? Now, Kyle Montgomery caught this fantastic footage of the Nilesat launch. Check out this video here. It is always nice to get alternate views of launches. The SpaceX live streams all end up looking very similar with the same angles and shots each time. So I really do appreciate alternate perspectives. Early last week, NASA's massive Artemis 1 moon rocket returned to the launch pad after a 10 hour rollout from the vehicle assembly building down the four mile track to launch complex 39B. On the 19th of June, NASA will begin its second attempt at fully fueling the rocket and launch simulation. This is a test dubbed a wet dress rehearsal that'll test every single system that'll be needed for a launch, including the countdown, except of course, at the end, the rocket will stay firmly on the ground. NASA first attempted this back in April during the very first SLS rollout, but unfortunately, loose flange bolts contributed to a hydrogen leak in the umbilical cords from the mobile launch platform to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, and NASA was unable to complete the fueling process of the test. Hopefully things go well this time around. The wet dress rehearsal is the final set of tests the rocket will need to undergo before it can finally launch. So I'm keeping my fingers and toes crossed that it'll be a success and that we can finally see an SLS launch this year. On Thursday, the gigantic Strato launch carrier aircraft took to the skies in the Mojave Desert for its sixth test flight. The Strato launch program experienced some rockiness back in 2019 after the death of its founder, Paul Allen, left the company in a bit of an uncertain position. We weren't sure at the time if this aircraft would ever have a future, but it looks like Strato Launch are pressing ahead now. The aircraft was initially designed to carry air launch to orbit rockets, similar to Virgin Orbit's Cosmic Girl, but after being acquired by Cerberus Capital Management, Strato Launch's objectives have shifted to instead using the aircraft to offer high speed flight test services. In addition to this, though, Strato Launch are developing the Talon A reusable rocket plane, which will be launched from the aeroplane. In fact, up to three Talon A's can be simultaneously carried by the Strato Launcher. Talon A is basically just a prototype that will lay the foundations for the Talon Z, which is a much larger concept vehicle that can potentially carry cargo or people to low Earth orbit. Exciting times lie ahead for Strato Launch. Now, unfortunately, last week's test flight was cut a little bit short, ending just 90 minutes after takeoff instead of the planned three and a half hours. All we know is that the crew encountered an unexpected reading. Hopefully, it's nothing major. Now, back in December last year, Falcon 9 Booster 1069 carried the Dragon CRS-24 cargo vessel to the International Space Station. While the mission itself was a success, the booster suffered some damage upon touchdown. Sean, of Deimos Photography, snapped these pictures of it arriving back at Port Canaveral, capturing extensive damage to the Merlin engine bells, with the booster itself sitting at a 5 degree tilt. SpaceX packed the booster up and shipped it off to its refurbishment facilities, and we hadn't really heard any news since. Until now! Sean caught this video of the booster on the move once again. It looks like SpaceX are yet to attach new landing legs and grid fins to the rocket, and I guess we can't really see the status of the engines here, but hopefully things are looking good for 1069, and it will still be able to complete its next launch, which is currently expected to be the Starlink Group 426 mission in August this year. Now, I'm not sure if this has happened yet, but Astra were planning to launch their latest Rocket 3 mission on Sunday. Unfortunately, the expected launch time is after I finish editing and uploading this video. Patrons and channel members get these videos one day early. So if this launch does happen, then I'll have to discuss it in next week's episode of Space This Week. Make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss out. <laughs> NASA has revealed that the James Webb Space Telescope has suffered from a few micrometeorite impacts. 
four in total now, which was always an expectation for the spacecraft, though the latest impact that it sustained was from a larger meteorite than teams had modeled or could test for on the ground. However, worry not, NASA is confident that these impacts shouldn't affect the telescope's ability to deliver pristine images to Earth, and we needn't forget about the Harlan J. Smith telescope. For those that haven't heard of this telescope, it's a 2.7 meter telescope located at the McDonald Observatory in Texas. The reason that I'm bringing it up is because in February of 1970, a worker suffered a mental breakdown and brought a handgun to the observatory, firing one shot at his supervisor before emptying the gun's rounds into the telescope's primary mirror. Despite this, the quality of the telescope's images were entirely unaffected. So I have hope that James Webb is, is gonna be all right. <laughs> Check out this image shared by NASA on the 10th of June. This looks like a fairly unassuming clean room photo, but behind this gantry is the Orion crew module for Artemis II. This picture was taken on the 27th of May during a test in which technicians powered on the crew capsule for the very first time. This particular Orion module will be the very first to carry astronauts. The Orion capsule that's currently sitting atop the SLS stack for Artemis 1 will be flying uncrewed, so I think that this capsule is much more exciting. Don't get me wrong, Artemis 1 will still be an amazing mission, but I think that the star of that particular show will be the maiden flight of the gigantic SLS rocket. Artemis 2 will be using real astronauts and will set the stage for future landing missions through the Artemis program. Artemis 2's flight plan will see the astronauts fly all the way out to the moon and back with a final re-entry speed of a toasty 25,000 miles an hour. With the initial power on now complete, the crew module will spend the next few months undergoing a three-part test, which will include applying power to each of the eight power and data units that help provide communication between Orion's flight computers and its components. In addition to this, teams will begin installing the forward bay cover, which protects the top part of the crew module during the final Earth re-entry at the end of the mission. As for the rest of the stuff required for Artemis 2, that being the giant SLS rocket, NASA has joined the rocket's core stage forward assembly with the 130-foot liquid hydrogen tank, which completes assembly of four of the five large structures that make up the core stage. I can't wait to talk about the hopeful success of both Artemis 1 and Artemis 2 in future installments of Space This Week, but for now, today's episode is a wrap. I'd like to give a big thank you to all of the names on screen. These people make all of this content possible by supporting me on Patreon and through my YouTube channel membership scheme. You can sign up to either program using the links below the video, or you can simply click the Patreon card on screen. There are also two other videos there from my channel that YouTube's algorithm thinks you'll enjoy. Hopefully they're good picks. Thank you so much for watching everyone, and I'll catch you all next time. There's going to be a super cursed KSP video on Saturday, so watch out for that.